Welcome everyone to a special edition of Fox 11 News In Depth. I'm Marla Tejas. I'm here for host Hal Eisner. Today we are exploring the social justice movement and police reform in the days following the death of George Floyd at the hands of police officers. Starting tomorrow, each night at 6 p.m. right here on Fox 11, we are bringing you a limited edition documentary series. Let's take a look at Rising Up. I can breathe. I have never seen a man die on camera. I can't until I saw George Floyd. What is going through this officer's mind? This man is literally dying under his knee. We're just fighting for equal rights for black people. We're supposed to be the land of the free, and yet we're judging people based off the color of their skin. Put your hands up right now. Please don't shoot me, please, man. Oh my God. It's important not only to end police brutality, but also to show our children that we can stand up against crimes against African-Americans. We have a right to rage. We have a right to be in the street. We have a sacred duty to shut down business as usual. And that doesn't make us violent. That makes us freedom fighters. That pressure cooker could not withstand any more pressure. And thus, it exploded. Another grandchildren. Some big topics covered over five nights. Peaceful protests versus riots and looting. Policing versus defunding the police. And where the social justice movement goes now. Joining our discussion today are a couple of very familiar faces. They do not need an introduction, but they deserve one. Our anchors, Christine Devine and Michaela Pereira. Thank you both for being here and welcome. Thank you. All right, let me open this conversation by asking the both of you, members of the media, women of color, how challenging was it to cover the death of George Floyd and then also the protests that followed and to do so objectively? I know you have very different perspectives. So, Christina, I'm going to start with you. Well, I, I was at home for the pandemic when the protests happened here in L.A. and insisted on coming in to cover this due to the breaking nature of things. But I want to cover it as a place of humanity, a person of humanity. And I, I, you know, I'm not on a show or a shift where people really are asking my opinion. Mm. So I tried to kick in the journalistic integrity, which is to look at what was happening, the video, uh, listen to what the discussions were about and the voices, to ask the questions. But also being here for 30 years, I wanted to also widen the lens of the discussion over time. It's about reform and police. It was a youth movement and also people who witnessed the 92 riots, for example. Mm. And I thought that was very important that we bring everybody into this discussion because my opinion is that we are all in this together as we move forward. As you say, humanity. Uh, Michaela, you have a very different perspective because you didn't necessarily cover this. No, I was between my uh, jobs. It was just before I came to work here, actually. And I remember being sequestered in my home as we all were at a time of his death. I remember this very distinctly. And I remember seeing everything that was rising up and it's so appropriately named the title of our documentary. I could feel it. I could feel it in the conversations I was having. I could see it in my social media feeds. I could see it in the coverage. And so did my anxiety because I have skin in the game, as do you, Christine, as all of us do. By the way, all of us do. This is a human rights issue. This is a humanity issue, as Christine was talking about. And I remember thinking, you know, th these are my people <laughs> that I am afraid for. These are my people asking for change. I am calling for change. We have to address these issues. And how was that transition for you, Michaela? Let's keep going with that. Given that you were at home, you, you know, were not it's with so the team yet. so interesting you should say that. Yeah, so it, it was very interesting because I kept thinking like, you know, I kept looking at the scenario and thinking, okay, I'm on the sidelines right now. You know, I'm a person of faith. And I kept thinking, okay, coach, is this the time I need to be put in? And sure enough, I came to work here shortly thereafter because I felt like I needed my voice to be part of the conversation. We do not advance 
as a world, as a nation, if we don't listen to one another. Until we identify our problems and we work together to overcome them, and I wanted to be part of that. I'm always about solutions and about building bridges, and so I knew I needed to be part of these conversations. And part of it is identifying what's not working. Christine, you, as you said, you covered the 92 riots. What was uh, the big difference, do you think, between covering the 92 riots and then also the death of, of George Floyd? I think uh, the protests that you saw were all over the world, all over Los Angeles in every county, probably every city. When you think back to the 92 uh, civil unrest and the riots, they were more limited to perhaps maybe South LA. And I talked to one mother and she was so surprised by seeing that white people were out there with black people arm in arm in the protest. And, and I did a great story on her and her mother and what she had been through uh, as a young woman and child herself and, 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 and racism herself. And she said her mother would be shocked to see the, the people coming together rising up with questions and concerns and calls for reform. Well, if you can believe it, uh, one year ago today, George Floyd was still here. He was still alive. Uh, we, we are here now, a year later. Uh, Christine, what do you think th the big lesson has been in all this? Have we grown at all? I think the takeaway from this is that there are communities that have felt unheard and unseen, and cameras shed the light on that discussion. I think that, as I said before, we are in this together with a discussion moving forward. And I think that's the takeaway. I, I just did a, a story with LAPD's Community Safety Partnership Bureau. A whole bureau came out of these protests, and this is in Watts, and it's based on community partnership. Mm -hmm. So I think that the discussions, whichever side you're on with this, are moving forward with where we go from here. Because the conversation continues. What is your takeaway, you Michaela? Know, it's, it's interesting. This time around, I've covered in my career so many of these incidences. I covered Michael Brown. I covered Philando Castile and, and so many others whose names should always be on our lips. This felt different, and partly, I think, it's because of the fact that George Floyd was killed while we were in isolation. We could not turn away. We couldn't flinch. We had to pay attention. Our collective attention was on this. And it really, I think, spoke to so many people. And as Christine, you mentioned, this was different when you look at who was marching in the streets, who was calling for action, who was saying, share the mic, who was saying, let's turn a spotlight on black and brown creators on social media. Mm. Those were allies, right? White mm -hmm. people, people of other races standing together saying, this has to be different this time around. And I believe it was. It's, it's been part of a, 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 a sea change. Mm -hmm. Well, we thank you so much for your perspective, both of you, with incredibly... Uh, uh, important perspectives, Michaela Pereira and, of course, Christine Devine. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks, Marla. And we'll be touching on some of these topics in our documentaries. Uh, the Rising Up team did some 25 interviews, hours of conversations with protesters, law enforcement, activists, and community members. Coming up next, we talk to longtime civil rights activist Connie Rice about how we can find a way forward amidst our current racial divide. Welcome back to In Depth as we take a look at the new Fox 11 docuseries Rising Up. Just a few weeks ago, we saw the officer involved in the killing of George Floyd convicted of murder. But even as that case was going on, the toll of officer involved killings in the U.S. continued to rise. A recent story in The New York Times talked about and tallied uh, three killings a day nationwide, about half of those victims black or Latino. Joining us now to talk about this seemingly endless problem of police killings is attorney and civil rights activist Connie Rice. Welcome, Connie. Thank you so much for being with us today. First of all, let's start with the conviction of Derek Chauvin uh, just a few weeks ago, as mentioned. How significant was that? I think it was significant to the Floyd family, and it was significant because it was such a huge exception to what normally happens. Hmm. Uh, the, the Chauvin trial happened in spite of our system, because I've, I've had this argument with a number of people uh, that, oh, it shows that it works, Connie. I said, no, it actually confirms that our system absolutely objectively fails when it comes to adjudicating abuses and excessive force by officers. 
um, the system is set up to reinforce officer power and license to kill. It is set up to reinforce uh, the state power to police. Because when you sue a cop, you're not just suing that officer or that department, you are challenging the state's sovereign police power. That's why the entire system is set up to exonerate and to, and to refrain from actually charging excessive force. And you see all those videos where folks are looking at them like, why couldn't they have, why did they have to shoot him in the back? Why did they have to shoot him? He was trying to comply. Those, in, those, those 16 to 20 videos that, that are just atrocious to watch. Mm -hmm. And you wonder, what is the cop thinking? Mm -hmm. Well, the Chauvin trial was like an exception because number one, uh, there was an indictment, there was an investigation and then an indictment. You realize that the entry that night by Chauvin and the other police officers, the entry into the Minneapolis police log read something like, man dies in medical incident while engaging with police. Nothing about a knee on the neck for nine and a half minutes, mm -hmm. nothing about protesters and EMT workers trying to, get, trying to get medical help, nothing of what we saw in that trial. Marla, there would have never been an investigation, there would have never been an indictment, there never would have been a trial, never mind a conviction. So that entry right there was a lie. And that is what happens over and over and over again. You blue wash it. You blue wash the circumstances so you don't know what's going on. Without that video by that wonderful young woman who had her cell phone out, sent her little niece into the store so she wouldn't see a murder on TV in front of her and videotaped what Chauvin did to Mr. Floyd, um, there would have been no trial. There have been videos before. Why George Floyd's death? Why, why his, in particular, ignited this social justice, civil rights movement? I think that because there were so many people stuck at home looking at the video, but more importantly than that, it was the movement. This incident did not create the Black Lives Matter movement. It had been brewing for a good almost decade before that. So it was the movement that had been gathering steam and, be, and was being built by young people uh, and, and their allies. Uh, it was the fact that we were stuck at home. And it was, it was also the fact that we, we've been 30 years into police reform. We've only had police reform for about 30 years since the Rodney King uh, mm -hmm. uh, uh, riots. And um, in that time, some things have changed at the top, but the fundamental mission of policing hasn't changed. It is still aggressive, hyper-vigilant, paramilitary, crush and control, obedience, control, and uh, what we call the blue grip. It's that, it's that uh, hyper-aggressive, you know, shoot first, ask questions later. It's that, it's that mode of policing that is dehumanizing to the poor black community and poor immigrant and my other minority communities. In inner city America, you get aggressive mass incarceration, containment, suppression, policing. It is not meant to be safety delivering. It is to deliver enforcement. It is to deliver the thin blue line cordon around communities that are poor and desperate and have violence and a lot, lot and no opportunity. And we call them ghettos and barrios. We design them and we send the police in there to make sure that the violence and the misery and the despair in those communities don't get to neighborhoods like mine. We have so when when you send in police to do that kind of mission, you get what we see. I want to end by asking you, what is the next step in the movement? I can't speak for the movement. I can speak for what people are doing on the inside of police forces because I knew that my cases weren't going to solve this problem, even though we won all of our cases. That you can sue, you can legislate, you can litigate. You can do all kinds of things, but the thing that changes the hearts and minds of police is when you change the leadership to the kind of leaders that we've had in the recent past. At the top, policing has changed. In the squad room, at the back of the squad room, it hasn't changed. And we're still working on it. You saw the CSP Bureau, the Partnership Policing Bureau that is co-created with residents of Watts and residents of East LA, poor folks and housing projects joining together with reformed cops to create a safety system rather than a question controls shock and awe enforcement system. That's the future, partnership policing. Chief Moore has just created a, 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 an entire bureau. And um, that's the future. If the, if the rest of the culture, policing culture, isn't smart enough to go along with that, then the policing as we know it does need to end. 
Civil rights activist and attorney Connie Rice, thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you. One of the people you will hear from in Rising Up, Rodney King's daughter, Laura, her poignant message 30 years after her father's story. Why are we still going through this? And we're in America, we're supposed to be the land of the free, and yet we're judging people based off the color of their skin, but not the condition of their heart. Rising Up premieres Monday at 6 on Fox 11, and we'll be back with more Fox 11 News in depth, and our discussion of social justice continues right after the break. We are back now on this special edition of Fox 11 News in depth, talking about the critical conversations covered in our upcoming limited series of documentaries called Rising Up. To carry on this conversation, joining us now is Mo Kelly from KFI AM 640 Talk Radio. Thank you so much for being with us, Mr. Kelly. Mala, thank you for having me. Let me ask uh, a very similar question that I asked our former guest, Connie Rice. Uh, I, I want to know what, why you think the death of George Floyd in particular sparked the social justice, racial justice movement that it did? I don't know if it was just the death of George Floyd. We know that the video had a disproportionate impact than I would say other cases. But whenever you have social unrest, historically, it's never been about just one person or one incident. If we go back to 1992, we usually refer to it as the Rodney King riots. But mm -hmm. people forget that the death of Latasha Harlins in the, in the days surrounding Rodney King's beating and that video coming up had a lot to do with why uh, after the verdict, the city descended into civil unrest. And going back to George Floyd, it wasn't just about George Floyd. There was Breonna Taylor also mm -hmm. within that news cycle. So it wasn't just George Floyd. It wasn't just a video. Mm -hmm. Even though George Floyd's video had the, the greatest impact, whenever you see civil unrest, it's never just one thing. It's a, it's a culmination of a lot of incidents which have bubbled to the surface. All right, well, things have quieted down since the summertime protests that we saw following the death of George Floyd. Uh, what do you make of this last year as we mark uh, the one year that it's been since his death? What do you make of progress made? Has progress been made? I don't make much of it. I look at progress through the lens of um, actual legislation, something that could prevent something like this George Floyd from happening again. And when we look at it, at it through that prism, nothing is very different. Uh, there's nothing on the books to really prevent what happened to George Floyd happening in some other city. Now, maybe not in Minnesota, but not in necessarily in Los Angeles. We're more awake than ever before, and this is generational in nature. Yes, you saw white Americans and you, you saw Asian Americans and you saw brown Americans uh, walking arm in arm in support, in solidarity. But I'm not so sure that you can say that there is momentum to actually see this through to the finish line where we change the circumstances which led up to this point. So I'm not exactly um, um, positive that we've made some sort of great gain just because Derek Chauvin, one individual, was found guilty. We needed a nine-minute video and mm -hmm. we needed all sorts of social unrest from coast to coast just to get to this point. I want to get your take on uh, the difference between uh, looting and peaceful protests because we saw some of those peaceful protests and turn into nighttime looting. Do you think that the message got lost in that and are we beyond that at this point given the time that has transpired? The message will always get lost when there is a degree of criminality in juxtaposition to it. Now, a, a reasonable person can be able to differentiate between someone who's out there trying to engage in criminal chaos and someone who's actually out there trying to bring light to an issue of relevance in terms of justice. If a person doesn't want to make that distinction or doesn't understand that distinction, I think they're being disingenuous. No one who is supporting this particular movement of justice is endorsing looting or criminal behavior. There will always be those people who are there to incite. There will always be there people who are there as opportunists to get something for themselves and have no care or connection to the movement. Mm -hmm. But I think we should be grown enough to understand that if they're engaging in looting and criminality, they're not connected to the movement. And if people want to associate the two, they're willing, they're doing that willingly and they're doing it dishonestly. One of the movements out there is to defund the police. We've been talking about that for months now. Uh, what do you make of that? I think it was a horrible choice of slogan. I think it, it, it minimizes 
the complexity of the issue. It is not just an economic issue. It's not a budget line item you know, uh, issue. It, it goes back to something that Connie Rice was saying. It, it, it speaks to the types of police engagement. There's a degree of animosity. Mm -hmm. And I think that, um, to use her word, an aggressiveness in which you have that first point of contact between law enforcement and black and brown communities, which has not been addressed. And simply taking $50 million off, for example, mm -hmm. of the LAPD, it's not going to change that engagement. It's going to antagonize the relationship, I believe, more. I thought politically it was a misstep, and in a message sense, message sense it really set back the movement to a great degree because people tune out when you hear defund the police. They think of more crime, more um, um, cr uh, just unsafety mm -hmm. overall. And that's what they've received, not a better police community. How do you bridge the divide uh, between law enforcement officers and the community? There has to be more listening. There has to be a willingness to understand that black and brown people, our experiences specifically are real. The, thing, the things that we're seeing on video now are not new. We can go back to 1965 and the Watts riots with Marquette Fry and what led to those uh, uh, riots in 1965. It's not different, not fundamentally different from 1992 and Rodney King. And it's not fundamentally different from George Floyd. So clearly that problem has not been addressed. And even though we've been, we as black and brown people have been saying this has been happening for decades. The only difference now is we can see it in high definition, but the problem itself has not changed or been minimized in any way. KFI host Mo Kelly, as always, we thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you. We'll be right back. That's it for this week's Fox 11 News in depth. Thank you so much for being with us. Our host Hal Eisner returns next week after a couple of months off to heal from his injury suffered when he and his photographer Joab Perez were hit by a suspected drunk driver. Hal and Joab will talk about their journey to recovery on next week's show. But as we say goodbye, let's share the images again from our upcoming limited documentary series, Rising Up. The first episode will air tomorrow evening at 6 p.m. here on Fox 11. I can't breathe. I have never seen a man die on camera. I can't breathe. Until I saw George Floyd. What is going through this officer's mind? This man is literally dying under his knee. We're just fighting for equal rights for black people. We're supposed to be the land of the free, and yet we're judging people based off the color of their skin. Put your hands off right now. Please don't shoot me, please, man. Oh my God. And it's important not only to end police brutality, but also to show our children that we can stand up against crimes against African Americans. Oh